If you have any more quizzes, please bring them in right now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, folks. Can't take extra. This is not. Oh, that's it. Just throw it away. A, we don't care. Just throw it away. They're in my office. Yeah. So, you, so you probably took your time, huh? Because I took them into my office a week and a half after I put them out. What? No, no, it's right here in my office. Okay. Upstairs. Okay, KMAC 969. Okay, folks. Where is everybody? People in the other room seem to have disappeared. Yeah. It's like an episode of Manifest. Okay, I'm going to get started because I don't know where the rest of the people went, so... So the usual rules apply as soon as the quizzes are graded, I will let you know you can pick them up at the usual spot. Um, but we have only six sessions left, including this session. So I kind of want to get you started on that project, that you know, the pricing part, because the DCF part, you're pretty much. Hey, folks, either sit down or leave. So the DCF part, you're pretty much done, but the pricing part you have, if you're still putting off, do it quickly, get it done, because it's going to finish the project. There's not that much group work involved. So at least get together as a group, pull everything together, kind of. I know at this point in the year, you don't want to hang out with other people at Stern, and I understand that, so I kept the group work to as little as possible. So get your evaluation done, and then get together as a group at least a couple of times so you can put that final project report together. And remember, the due date is May 13th, the last day of class, the, the Monday of the last day. So make sure you turn it in by 5 p.m. that day. 
So let's talk. It's amazing how many people got religious over this weekend. <laughs> I have a tough time getting my kids to go to Easter Sunday. It's like one, my youngest claims to be a satanic worshiper. Every time I ask him to go to church, I'm worshiping Satan. I'm not coming to church. But some of you guys seem to go to church on Monday, at least according to your emails. You have Easter Monday following Easter Sunday. I am, I am in awe at your parents, not at you, that they can actually get you to go to church on Monday. But no, it is what it is. Right? Because you, you know you can't lie about Easter Sunday, right? So I kind of took you at your word. No? But let's com complete packet two. We were talking about valuing private companies is one final piece that I want to talk about, okay? which is we talked about valuing private companies for sale to another individual. When you sell to another individual, what are the two things you have to worry about? One is that the buyer is not diversified. So you've got to adjust the beta. And the second is that there's a liquidity issue. You've got to knock off for 10, 15, 20%. But then we looked at private to public. What do we do there when you're selling to a public company? You act like nothing's happening. Basically, market beta, no liquidity discount, everything's like a tradition. Then we looked at private to IPO. What are the twists we have to factor in? One is an IPO proceeds. You've got to figure out what happens to the 1 billion, 3 billion, 5 billion, 10 billion that you get as proceeds because it can stay in the company, leave the company, go to pay down debt. And the second is, IPOs are a pricing game. Investment bankers guarantee an offering price, so they're likely to be underpriced. Okay. The final piece of private company valuation. Here come the rest of them. What happened to you guys? Did they start late or something in the other room? OK. Have you got extra time? No. OK. So last particular private company valuation I'm going to do is private to venture capital, to public. Because let's face it, here's the sequence that most private companies go through. You start as a private company where the founder owns all of the companies. So you're a startup. And as you get bigger, what do you do? You approach venture capitalists for more capital. And if you're in the right sector, at some point in time, you exit by going public. You're saying, so what? If you think about the diversification argument, it turns out that Private owners tend to be not diversified at all. Public, you know, going public, you're fully diversified, but venture capitalists fall in the middle. And here's why. Venture capitalists might have 30 or 40 or 50 holdings, but most venture capitalists tend to be sector focused. They're all software companies, they're all technology companies, they're all ride sharing companies, and because of that, they can't get the full benefits of diversification, they get part way there. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to take a private company, a private business that you're the owner of right now, and I'm going to estimate your cost of equity at each stage in the process. You know what I mean by each stage? First stage, you are the private owner. All of your equities invest in the business, so you think of it as a total beta. You come up with a cost of equity that reflects your total beta four, and your cost of equity is huge. Two years from now, I expect you to go out to venture capitalists. I don't know, but I'm assuming as you grow, you go to venture capitalists. Let's say venture capitalists have a correlation which is higher with the market. That's what happens as you get partially diversified. Their correlation is 0.5, the beta drops to two, and your cost of equity drops to 14%. Five years from now, based on expectations, you think your company will go public. And when it goes public, you shift to a market beta. So the beta is not, the, the market beta is not changing, but the perceived cost of equity is changing depending on who's supplying the capital. So here's what you will have in your valuation. For your first two years, your cost of equity is going to be 24%. Years three to five, it's going to be 14%. And after year five, it's going to be, 10, it's going to be 9%. So when I did my valuation, here's what I did. For the first two years, cost of equity of 24. For the next three years, cost of equity of 14%. And when I did my terminal value calculation, my cost of equity shifted to 9%. Same company, three different types of investors. You can see my discount rate change. If I take the present value using the right discount rates, the value that I get is 1.5 billion. Most VC valuations, when I see discount cash flow valuations, they either stick with that high cost of equity all the way through because they don't know you can adjust discount rates. And if I did that, I'm gonna undervalue the firm by almost 300 million. Or they use the market cost of equity all the way through on the false presumption, eventually I'm going to be public, so why should I care? In which case, I overvalue the firm. 
That's why you need to adjust cost of equity and cost of capital. So remember for growth companies, public companies, we adjusted the discount rate because a company's risk changes. Here it's not the company's risk that's changing. It's the characteristics, the investor investing in the company that are changing, and the cost of equity shifts as you go through. So any questions at all about private company valuations? If I gave you a private company to value, you should be able to do it, right? So this summer, here's what I want you to do. Pick a friend, a relative, a family member who owns a private business, offer to value it for them, for free. Do it for free, that way you can give a money back guarantee. Yeah. And get your hands wet. It's actually a fascinating exercise in collecting information because it's not like looking at 10 Ks. You actually have to talk to the owner and figure out what he or she does every day and think about what it, remember the salary you got imputed? It's actually a very interesting exercise in valuation because each valuation is different and unique. So everybody get private company valuation? Because, so let's, let's draw everything together. Here are the implications. The value of a private, private business is a, that is expected to transition to becoming a public company will be greater than the value of a private company where that transition does not happen. So if you're a private company in the technology space, your value will be much higher than the private company in the restaurant space. Why? Tech companies are more likely to be bought by other public companies or go public. Second, as IPOs boom, private company valuations will go up with them. So when people talk about private markets versus public markets, they're missing the point. They're connected at the hip. The reason private company valuations are soaring is because public company valuations are soaring. If public company valuations crash, private company valuations will also crash. And private companies in countries where there is easy access to public markets will be worth more than private companies in markets where you don't have that access. Europe, historically, private companies have had a much more difficult time making it to market. So other things remaining equal, a European company versus a US company, exact same characteristics, the European company will be worth less. Except you know what European companies are increasingly starting to do, right? They go public in the US. It's, so once you open up the, the space, you're going to see private company valuations start to increase across the board. Now, the, uh, the second point I would make is private businesses if they make the, that make the transition to public companies sooner rather than later will be worth more than companies that don't, don't make the transition. But you're saying, what about Uber? Uber's been private for a long time, right? So it must have left a lot of money on the table being a private company. So what's changing about private company capital that is allowing companies like Uber to stay private for so long? The old transition, what happened? You started as a owner-owned company, then you went to VCs, and then how did you exit? You went public. What's changed? Who's been... In fact, it's not just VCs. Who's been investing in Uber for the last two or three years? It's actually the Saudi investment fund, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price. Basically, what you've created is this gray area where public investors are actually investing in private companies. And what that's allowing them to do is actually get the benefits of being a public company because you get the capital being raised from diversified investors without any of the disclosure requirements. We're creating a bit of a monster, if you ask me, under the surface, because we're allowing basically a $100 billion company to exist without any disclosure requirements. You know why the SEC has not raised a finger? It says these are rich people, they can afford. But the problem is if it's T. Rowe Price and Fidelity invest, or NYU, remember increasingly endowment funds are investing in this space as well. Then you're dragging in people who can be hurt by the lack of disclosure. So something to think about. I think that we are creating this middle market, but there is a consequence. We're creating more liquidity for private companies, but in the process, we're also creating some disclosure nightmares. Okay. Any questions on private companies? So let me summarize what we've learned. The value of a private business can never be estimated in a vacuum. You've got to figure out who the potential buyer is and what the motive is. Okay. Second. If you are selling a private business, you should be selling it to a long-term investor who also happens to be well diversified, who doesn't think much about you, much of you. You know why? What happens if he thinks you're critical to the company? What's going to happen? There's going to be a key person discount. So you know what? You, there's a reason why the Japanese are so humble. Oh, I am nothing. I do nothing for the business. You think they're just being humble? 
It increases the value of your company. You don't want to be in there. I am critical to the company. You might think you're scoring some points, but actually lowering the value of your company by making that. So when you're selling the business, act like you know nothing. So I know nothing. I'm a stupid guy. These people run the company. They're the ones, the critical parts of the company. It might require bringing your ego down, but for 10 million, would you bring your ego down? I would. No. That's a, so if you're valuing a private, so if you're valuing a private business for a transaction, those are the rules. If you're valuing a private business for legal purposes, your end game is no longer to get the value right, but to make sure the value meets all the check boxes. This is why I never write about valuation for fair value accounting or legal accounting. It's pointless. It's not about what the right answer is. What can you get away with that meets every single rule? So that's pretty much everything I want to say about private company valuation. If you wanted to price a private company, I didn't talk about that. What would you do? You can go one or two routes. You can try to find other private companies and transactions, right? The only problem is there aren't that many transactions. You got to bunch, so you can look at other doctors' practice. But the data is messy, and the transactions are not always arm's length. You know what I mean by that? There might be side deals done, so the price. You can take public companies and get the PE ratios, EV, debit, debit, but then what do you have to do? You have to adjust for the fact that you're private, which means you've got to talk about discounting that 12 PE to make it 7 for a private company. But you can, if you, can, you can price private companies as well, and people do it all the time. So now we're going to move on to the third and final packet. If you don't have it, not a big deal. Print it off you know, or download it before the next class. So if you bought the second packet at the bookstore, it already includes the third packet as well. So it's in the same packet. So let's talk about what perhaps in valuation is the only part of valuation we can talk about things being a little different, a little new. So when you think about traditional discounted cash flow valuation, here's what you do. You take the expected cash flows, as you can estimate them today, you discount them back at a risk-adjusted discount rate, you come up with the value. And you say, that's my value for the company. And for the most part, that is a pretty reasonable intrinsic value. But here's what you might be missing when you do a traditional discounted cash flow valuation. In some cases, an investment that doesn't make sense today could still be, the rights to that investment can still be valuable. Why? Let's say I gave you the rights to a non-viable technology, a telecom or you know, pharmaceutical drug. Right now, it's not viable. But I give you the rights to that drug for the next 15 years. Why might you pay for it, even though it's not viable today? It could change, right? It could become valuable. The market could be get a bigger. The technology could change. That's called the option to, to, to delay, where a project that looks bad today could become valuable in the future. Let's suppose you do a valuation of investing in entering the Chinese market, and you come up with a negative net present value. It says, don't enter the market. Traditional valuation, you stop there, right? But maybe if you enter the market and it does better than expected, you might be able to expand into the rest of a really big market. That option to expand can add value. That might make you take a project that otherwise looks bad. And finally, let's say you take a long-term project. It's a 50-year project based on expected cash flows. The net present value looks positive. Two years in, you realize the cash flows are coming in 50% below expectations. Do you have to stick around for the next 48 years? If you can get out, you'd get out now, right? That's called the option to abandon. We're going to talk about how those options can change the way you perceive the value of a company using traditional valuation as a platform. So before we go down that route, we're going to do a very simple 30-minute introduction, 23-minute introduction, 22-minute introduction. I'm counting the clock right there, so no, 4.45. Two options. Everything you need to know about options, because next session we're going to act like you know option pricing. Okay? So let's set up the basis. For, this is called real, the real options. Let's uh, set up the basis. Let's suppose I came to you with an investment. Here's what the investment looks like. There's a 50% chance of making 100 million and a 50% chance of, making, of losing 120 million. Would you take this investment? What's the expected value? Minus 10 million, right? I'm going to do some magic here. I'm going to take this investment and break it up into two halves. So the first part of the half, you take the investment, there's a 75% chance of succeeding, you make 20 million, and there's a 25% ch chance of failing, in which case you lose 20 million. 
if you make the 20 million the, on the first, then you take a second leg. In the second leg, there's a two thirds chance of making a 80 million and a one third chance of losing 100 million. You know what the expected value? So if you look at this, basically I've given you 100 upside, 120 downside, which is exactly what we had in the previous thing. You take the probabilities and multiply through, there's a 50% chance and a 50. So it looks exactly, I mean, it should work out to the same, right? But if you take the expected value of this tree, it's positive. So I'm going to ask you the question, what is it that makes the second tree have a positive value when the first tree did not? What is it you're gaining in that second tree you could not in the first tree? What happens in this first branch? What are you getting? You're getting, it's like a market test. You're getting a prior view of, hey, is this project going to be a good project? And you get a negative view, what are you doing? You're stopping. And if you get a positive view, you're continuing. I'm going to give you the two words that are the basis for real options. The first word is learning. You're learning by looking at what's happening out there. And then the second word is you're adapting. You're changing your behavior to reflect what you've learned. That is at the basis for all real options. I'll give you an example. I'm going to argue that when you do a discounted cash flow valuation of an oil company, you're going to undervalue the oil company. And here's why. How do you do a discounted cash flow valuation of an oil company? You take the expected oil price times expected production, come up with expected revenues, right? You know what you're missing when you do that? What do oil company managers get to observe before they decide how much oil to extract? They could observe the oil price. The oil price is $100 a barrel. You decide to take a lot of oil out of the ground. If it's $20 a barrel, you stop producing. Nobody's on an autopilot. I have to produce 100 million barrels. When you do a traditional discounted cash flow valuation, you're missing that optionality, which is you can learn by looking at the oil price and adapt the behavior based on what you see. So I'm going to give you three basic questions that lie at the heart of real options because I'm a skeptic when it comes to real options. And here's why. Real options are hot. You know, management consulting firms love them. Investment banks love them. So everybody's using this tech. It's such a neat technology. They're bringing the real option here, a real option there. Because what it allows you to do is pay a premium over your discounted cash flow valuations. So remember the DCF value you got for your stock? For Netflix, you got 172 per share. With a real option, you say, I'll pay an extra 30, 40, 50, 60. Uber, you say, my discounted cash flow valuation was 60 billion, but there's optionality here. So I'm going to give you three basic questions you need to answer before you attach that premium. First is, let's think about when there is an option embedded in an asset. Because if there's no option, you shouldn't be bringing out the option pricing technology. Second, when does that option have significant economic value? Should we be wasting our time bringing out the option pricing mechanism if there's no... And third, can we actually estimate that value using an option pricing model? And I'll tell you up front what you're going to find. For 100 so-called options, 10 have economic value. And about three or four can actually be valued using an option pricing model. So let's start with the first question. When is there an option embedded in any kind of action? Go back and think about what an option gives you. An option gives you the right to do something, a contingent payoff, something you choose to do or not do. So embedded in an option is the right to either buy or sell something at a fixed price. The key word is fixed price. So for something to be an option, there has to be a fixed price, and you have to have the right to buy or sell that option at a fixed price. So there has to be a clearly defined underlying asset, right? And the payoff on that asset is going to be contingent on what happens. I still remember about 10 years ago, second year MBA was going through this class. Was after the option pricing class was done, he came to me and said, he was very excited. He said, I, own a, I, mean, I rent an apartment, and my landlord has given me the option to buy the apartment. He was very excited. He wanted to use a Black-Scholes model and come up with a value. And I said, aren't you getting a little carried away? He said, no, no, I've spent all this money in my MBA. I want to value this option. So I said, okay. So your landlord gave you the right to buy your apartment. Is that right? He said, yes. And what price did he mention? He thought about it for a moment. He said, he did not mention a price. I said, let me get this straight. You have the right to buy your apartment at whatever the prevailing market price is. Is that right? He said, yes, I guess that is. I said, how much do you think that's worth? What's the right to buy something at whatever the prevailing market price is? Anybody can do it. You're not so special. Anybody walking off the street can pay. If he'd specified 500,000, 300,000, a million, we can talk about option pricing. So there has 
to be specified price for the option you take in. And you know how you recognize an option, right? Remember your, your foundations class or your, fi your first finance class? How do you recognize an option? You draw a payoff diagram. And I'm not kidding. This is the way I, I always go back to payoff diagrams. When I draw the payoff diagram on an asset and it looks like this, you can call it whatever it wa you want, but it's a call option. What makes it unique? That kink at the strike price. Basically, below the strike price, you cannot lose more than what you paid for the option. And then you get that potentially unlimited upside. And if you give me a put option, I just flip the diagram around. You get limited losses if the stock price exceeds the strike. So if I draw the payoff diagram for something and it looks like this, I don't even have to tell you there's an option. You might as well bring out the option pricing technology. So that's the first stop is when does an option exist? Just draw the payoff diagram. Second stop, when does that option have significant economic value? I'm going to give you the word that I am most fond of using when I run into people who want to use options everywhere. The word I use is exclusivity. If you and only you can do this, then we can talk about option. But everybody can do it, like the right to buy your apartment at the market price. There is no option. In fact, the paper I have in Real Options, is, is the title is Opportunities Are Not Options. Because a lot of people say, I'm in a big market, therefore there must be options, right? Not necessarily. I'll give you an example again to bring this home. Let's assume you're Marriott. You decide to open 10 hotels in China. This is your first move into China. You do the present value of the hotels, and you come up with a negative net present value. So what does traditional capital budgeting say? Don't open the hotels, right? But then I said, look, if these 10 hotels get open and they do really well, much better. Because remember, you used expected cash flows. You don't know what will happen. Maybe Chinese consumers will love Marriott hotels. I mean, what's not like about that courtyard breakfast, the delicious egg that's been sitting in that pan for like two hours? Let's say it takes off. You know what you could do? You could open 100. This is a big market. So even though these 10 hotels have a negative net present value, the way you justify it is the market is big, and if things work out and the hotels do well, then I could open 100 more hotels, and that option to expand is going to take, it'll be much greater than the value. What's the weakest link in that argument? You open those 10 hotels. You watch how they're doing. Who else is watching? Oh, Ritz is watching, you know, every other hotel chain is watching. And if you're doing well, just as you get ready to open 100 hotels, what happens? Well, everybody jumps in. There is no exclusivity. You know what would make this an option? Is if in return for opening that 10 hotels, I got an exclusive license to open 100 more hotels. Then we can talk about real options. So the next time somebody brings up a real options argument, hone in on the exclusivity because without it, there is no value to the option. So when is there an option? Draw the payoff diagram. When does an option have significant economic value? The more exclusivity you have, the greater the economic value. And then you say, okay, when can I use an option pricing model? We know what drives the value of an option. There are only six variables that drive the value of an option. There are three relating to the underlying asset. The first is the value of the underlying asset. Every time that moves, the value of every option, because you get the right to buy at a fixed price. If it's a call option, the value of the underlying asset goes up. Calls become more valuable. Puts, though, you have the right to sell at a fixed price. Puts get less valuable. So that's the first. The second is the greater the variance in that value, the more valuable all options become. This is a new one, because up till now in this class, every time we've talked about risk, when we make something more risky, what happened to its value? In discounted cash flow valuation, we make something more risky, the discount rate went up, the value went down. In pricing, you made something more risky, the price earnings or the... So why is it with options that I seem to be changing my tune? Why is risk your ally with options when it's your enemy everywhere else? The volatile is cuts both ways, right? Because it's, we can say we make the same argument in DCF, right? Volatile can deliver upside, and but there I view it as a bad thing. What is it about options that makes them unique? I'm sorry. See the payoff diagram? What happens? Your doubt. Have you ever complained about upside risk? Say, so, oh my God, the stock was so risky it went up 80 percent. Notice nobody complains about upside risk. 
The risk that worries us is downside risk. And what have I done now with the options? I put a protection on the downside, which means now risk is now your ally. It's not your enemy. It is what, this is the part about real options I want you to take away because this is the only asset where as I increase risk, the asset will get more value. Thirdly, any time you expect a dividend on the underlying asset, it affects the value of your option. Think of why. When a stock pays a dividend on the ex-dividend day, you know the ex-dividend day is the date by which you have to buy the stock to collect the dividend. You know what happens to the stock price on the ex-dividend day? It drops by roughly the amount of dividends. Why does it have to? If it did not, what would you do? We just buy the stock on the ex-dividend day, collect the dividend, and get the stock price at the end, right? So to, to keep you from making easy money, the market kind of adjusts. You think, why should I care? If you have a call option on a stock that is going to pay a big dividend, do you see why it should worry you? Because the day the dividend gets paid, what happens? The stock price drops, your call option becomes less valuable. So on stocks where the expected dividend is high, it reduces the value of the call option, and it'll increase the value of your put option. So those are the three variables relating to the underlying asset. There are two variables relating to the option. First, remember the option gives you the right to buy at a fixed price if it's a call option, the right to sell at a fixed price if it's a put option. With a call option, the lower the strike price, the more valuable the option. You'd rather have the right to buy at $3 than $30. So as the strike price or the exercise price decreases, call options become more valuable. But the put option gives you the right to sell at a fixed price. So you'd rather have a higher strike price than a lower one, so it cuts in the opposite direction. And finally, the longer the life for your option, whether they're calls or puts, they both become more valuable. Why? Because the longer the time you get to play this game, the more likely it is you'll make money. So notice the variance in the life of the option cut the same way for both calls and puts. All the other variables cut in the opposite direction. And finally, the only macro variable that enters this process is the risk-free rate. The higher risk-free rate becomes, the lower the value you'll get for put options and the higher the value for call options. Why is that? What do you get with the call option? The right to buy at a fixed price, right? So when interest rates are high, the present value of what you have to pay two years from now becomes even lower. So it makes your call options more valuable. And put options, you get that money two years from now. If I make the interest rates high, that becomes less valuable. So those are the only six variables. So you ready for some option pricing? Even if you're not, I'm going to go there. So let's talk about when you can use option pricing models to value these real options. First, I'm going to take you through the process of option pricing. And all option pricing models are built on what's called a replicating portfolio. What you have in a replicating portfolio is you can create something that looks exactly like the option by combining the underlying asset and either borrowing or lending. So for option pricing to work, you have to be able to create a replicating portfolio. You're saying, what's the big deal? If I bought a call option on IBM, can I create a replicating portfolio? IBM is traded, I can borrow and lend, no big deal. I'm going to argue, in a, in a, in, in, maybe not in this session, but in the next one, that a patent on a drug is like an option. It is. But to create a replicating portfolio, what do I need to do? I need to be able to buy and sell the patent, which is not a traded asset. And all of a sudden, you can see the replicating portfolio. It doesn't mean you cannot use an option pricing model, but you have to be a lot more careful. Second, you've got to be able to do arbitrage. You're going to see this play out of the option pricing model. And you can see why replication arbitrage. So when we use option pricing models and real options, we're stretching the limits of option pricing models. So when you get a number, You've got to look at it with a lot more skepticism than when you get it on a listed option. So let's do some very basic option pricing. To replicate an option, all you need is a traded underlying asset and being able to lend or borrow. I'm going to show you in a minute that if you're trying to replicate a call option, here's how you do it. You go out and borrow money and buy a certain number of units in the underlying stock. You're saying, that's not very specific, a certain number of units. That's what the option pricing model will try to solve for. How much you need to borrow and how much of the underlying stock you need to buy. So to replicate a call, you borrow and buy the stock. To replicate a put, you sell short on the stock and you take the cash and you lend it out. So basically, underlying asset lending and borrowing allows you to create that replicating portfolio. In fact, the number of shares that you buy or sell to replicate is called the option delta. Option traders have taken over the Greek alphabet. 
delta, gamma, theta, everything has some meaning in the option pricing model, and we'll talk about why. So basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a replicating portfolio, and the idea of a replicating portfolio is that exactly the same cash flows as a call option or a put option. And if it has exactly the same cash flows, it has to sell at exactly the same price. Why is that? If you have two things which have the same cash flows, and one sells at a higher price and the other sells at a lower price, what are you going to be able to do? Buy the lower price, sell the higher price, lock in the profit, and because the cash flow is offset, this is true arbitrage. There's a lot of fake arbitrage out there. Like, for instance, there's something called merger arbitrage, which is not, mer which is not it's merger speculation. True arbitrage means you take no risk and you're guaranteed a profit. This would be true arbitrage. Okay. So I'm going to bring in option pricing models using the simplest mechanism for seeing arbitrage play out. It's using what's called a binomial model. You know what a binomial model is? At every point, your stock can jump to one of two points. And you're going to see why in a minute I had to make it binomial and not trinomial or quadrinomial binomial models. So here you have a stock that right now trades at 50. In the next time period, the stock can go to either 70 <coughs> or 35. If it goes to 70, the following time period is going to go to 100 or 60, um, 100 or 50. It goes to 35, it can either go to 50 or 25. So it's two time period model. I'm going to put a call option with a strike price of 40 on the stock, and it's going to expire at t equal to 2. So let's start easy. If the strike price is 40 and you hold it through two time periods, what's your cash flow going to look like at the end of the second time period if the stock goes to 100? You're going to be able to buy the stock at 40, sell it at 100, your cash flow is going to be 60. If it drops to, if the stock is 50, you buy it at 40, sell it at 50, it's dead. Stock cost drops to 25. You buy at 40, you sell at 25, you get minus 15. Why isn't it minus 15? What does your option give you? Not an obligation, but a right. That's the difference in options and futures, right? So the stock drops to 40, 25, what do you do? You take the option, you throw it in the trash can, and say, I wish I hadn't done that. But your cash flow is zero. So your cash flows at t equal to 2 on the option are 60, 10, and 0. Why am I starting at t equal to 2? That's the only time period where I can know with certainty what my cash flow is going to be. What's my end game? I'm going to create a combination of borrowing and buying shares of the stock that have exactly the same cash flows as the call option. So let me go start with the stock price at 70. You're going to see me work backwards to the binomial tree because otherwise I can't solve. So the stock price is 70. What are my two possibilities? You can go to 100 or go to 50, right? I'm going to go buy delta shares of stock. My deltas all turn to Ds, but think of them as deltas. I don't know what that delta will be. And borrow B dollars. So I have two unknowns. I'm going to borrow delta, I borrow B dollars and buy delta shares of stock. And if I do that, if the stock goes to 100, my position is going to be worth 100 times delta, the number of shares I bought, minus the borrowing paid back with 11% interest rate. And what does the cash flow have to be equal to? It's got to be equal to 60. So delta, 100 times delta minus the borrowing paid back has to be equal to 60. That is the stock price goes to 100. If the stock price goes to 50, I have 50 times delta minus 1.11 times it because I still have to pay, and that's got to be equal to 10. I know this is a throwback in time, but remember simultaneous equations? What is that, eighth grade, ninth grade? If you have two equations and two unknowns and you work long enough and hard enough, there should be no unknowns. So if you solve for that, you get delta is equal to 1, which means you buy one share of stock, and B is equal to, you're saying, what the heck does that mean? If the stock goes to 70 and I go out and borrow $36.04 and buy one share of stock, I will get exactly the same cash flows as I'd have got buying a call with a strike price of 40. I've created my replicating portfolio. How much will it cost me to create the replicating portfolio? Buying one share at 70 will cost me 70. I'm going to borrow 36.04 of it, so I have to come up with 33.96. Guess what? My call option. If the stock goes to 70, will be worth 33.96. That's the arbitrage. Replication, arbitrage. I do the same thing if the stock drops to, to, 30, uh, to uh, 35. I solve, and here it turns out that my delta is 0.4, and my borrowing is $9.01. You're saying, what does that mean? If the stock goes to 35, I go out and borrow $9.01 and buy 0.4. Don't even ask me how you buy 0.4 shares of stock you'll end up with a position that has exactly the same cash flows to call, and that position will cost me 4.99. So 
my value for the call, if the stock goes to 70, will be 30. Now do you see why I have to work backwards one step at a time? I have to solve it each stage. I get a value for the call. Then I go all the way back to t equal to zero. Stock is at 50. I go out and buy the stock at 50, and if the stock goes to 70, 70 times D minus one point. So I repeat the process. And I end up solving for a replicating portfolio that is self-financing. Once I create this portfolio by borrowing 2161 and buying 0.2878 shares of share, it'll fund itself all the way through. And at the end of time period, too, I will have exactly the same cash flows as the call. The value of that position is 1942. That will become the value of the call today. Now, why did I have to make it binomial? How many unknowns do I have? And what happens if I have three equations and two unknowns? This is the stuff of which nightmares are made. So my, because of the fact that I have two unknowns, I'm stuck with two. And it's a limit, right? Because basically, it means that my stock can jump to only one of two points at every stage. You see, what's the big deal? Let's say you take a three-month option. To have any chance of the stock jumping to only one of two points, I'm going to make time really, 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 really small, right? Milliseconds. And even then, I'm not sure, but let's say I could. Imagine drawing a binomial tree with one-second intervals for three months. Just imagine it. You're sitting there with a little graph paper and a magnifying glass and your little branches. And let's say you finish. It's going to look like a pine tree on its side, right? Basically, a little branch. Flip the pine tree over onto its base. What does it look like? It now looks like a real pine tree without. Now smooth out the outsides. Am I getting too abstract for you? You take a pine tree, you smooth out the outsides. What does it look like? It looks like a normal distribution. If I take the binomial model, and as time gets smaller and smaller, I make the price changes smaller, the binomial distribution converges on a normal distribution. The binomial option pricing model gives me the Black-Scholes model. So next session when we start off, I'm going to start with the Black-Scholes. But remember, just think of it as a more... And so if you can understand the binomial, you fundamentally understand how the Black-Scholes works, but it's just a, it's, a, it's a continuous version of the binomial distribution.
so.